what I'm going to try to do in the relatively short amount of time I have is to say a few words about how I think of research as a public good, um, what research or scientific integrity is, what research or scientific misconduct is, um, a little bit about conflicts of interest, and a little bit about the kinds of programs that are in place, at least in, in the United States, um, to help promote the responsible conduct of research. Um, we often call it RCR, Responsible Conduct of Research. We, we have all kinds of acronyms for all kinds of things. And if I go too fast, somebody just raise their hand. Sorry, I went the wrong way. So some of this is very, I think, self-evident. Um, I think that based on the fact that you're here, based on the fact that you spend your life doing research, um, I think we probably all agree in this room that the consequences of clinical research are often very good. They're a public good. But it's also true that the consequences of clinical research can, in some cases, be negative. Um, and so we need to always keep that, that in mind as well. It seems important, based on the good consequences of clinical research, the social value of research, that it ends up being translated and implemented into clinical practice, public health work, uh, et cetera. Otherwise, it loses its value. Um, it's also very important that all of us and everyone involved in research um, be um, careful and positive and honest about how we communicate about science to the public. And we should probably take the responsibility of communicating to the public about, about science and about research very seriously because there's a lot of misunderstanding among members of the public. I also think it's worth pointing out that in general, people in society, and it's not just Brazil, it's certainly the United States too, but it's not just both of those countries, but all over the world, tend to be attracted to the scandals. So if there are stories in the newspaper of negative kinds of ex ex uh, examples of research, those are the ones they're going to remember. Those are the ones they're going to read about. Those are the ones they're going to remember. So all the more reason that we need to be positive in terms of promoting the good consequences of research and the good things about research. So um, this is a quote from the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, which I think is, is very helpful in terms of thinking about the public trust in science. And basically it says, is the scientific research enterprise is, like other human activities, is built on a foundation of trust. Scientists trust that the results reported by others are valid, and we learned today what valid means in a lot of different ways. Society trusts that the results of research reflect an honest attempt by scientists to describe the world accurately and without bias. The level of trust that has characterized science and its relationship with society has contributed to a period of unparalleled scientific productivity. Now, this was written in 1995, but I would contend it's still, we're still in that <laughs> era of unparalleled scientific productivity. But then they went on to say, or to close with, but this trust will endure only if the scientific community devotes itself to exemplifying and transmitting the values associated with ethical scientific, scientific conduct. Well, I keep going backwards, sorry. Okay, so just a couple more thoughts about trust. Again, pretty self-evident, I believe. Researchers, those of us involved in research in a variety of ways, are given privileges. I mean, doing research is a privilege. And we're expected to use those privileges appropriately. The public, the taxpayers, patients, students, colleagues, etc., they trust science and researchers for the most part. And, and the violations of that trust can have widespread consequences. I, I pretty much already said this. So it seems true that researchers, regardless of who sponsors them, regardless of who pays for their research, are entrusted with the public confidence. They're entrusted with public confidence to be responsible stewards, to 
demonstrate concern for the people that they work with, for future people and for the environment, and to demonstrate that through the way that they conduct research. And then researchers who are also recipients of public monies have maybe a an additional responsibility to be wise stewards of those funds in the, in the interests of good research. Um, there has been, I'd say in the last 20 years more or less, an increased focus on responsible science. And some of that is uh, public visibility of science. You know, you read any newspaper, you'll find something about science in most days. Um, on the internet, you can find scientific, uh, stories of scientific accomplishments, sorry, stories of scientific scandals, all kinds of scientific information on the internet. So it's much more visible than it may have been um, in decades past. There's also true that science is increasingly cross cultures, cross boundaries, cross countries, um, being done all over the world. I think it, it makes it more complex in terms of our responsibilities to be ethically appropriate in our behaviors, but it's also really interesting to think about this. So one example, I found one paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that it was a study of a drug, a new drug for atrial fibrillation. And I'm not gonna talk about the drug. What I'm gonna talk about is the complexity of the design of the study in terms of people. So there were 18,000 participants. Some of the studies that were just described had even more participants. But in this study that I'm uh, alluding to, there were um, over 1,000 investigators in over 100 countries. And those are the ones that were reported in the paper. And I, I read it and thought, OK, what about the research, the study coordinators, the data collectors, the recruiters, the IRB members. I mean, you can go on and on and think about the complexity of conducting one sim simple, in some respects, but not simple, um, clinical trial. Um, it's also true that the demands and the challenges, to some extent anyway, outpace our ability to deal with them. That's why I like working in ethics. There's always a new challenge. There's always something that we, you know, maybe know something about or can think a little bit about based on previous things that research that we've done or previous uh, pre precedences and principles. But there's always a new challenge. Um, I was just talking at the break about IPS cells with one of um, the people in the audience here. And, you know, there's interesting challenges ethically from the use of IPS cells in research. And it's also a challenge for explaining that to the public. What does that mean? What are the opportunities? What are the drawbacks? And how to, how to explain it in ways they understand it. It's also true, and I don't think anyone in this room would disagree, there are competitions and stresses to doing science. And in, in many ways, those are getting more difficult. Those competitions are getting greater. The stresses are great, getting greater. In the United States, we talk about it in the, in one way anyway, with um, the pay line of of NIH grants, which keeps going down. Uh, I keep going the wrong way. Sorry. So I want to say, what's research integrity? Pretty straightforward. This is one definition from one website, but I think it's a good one. Research integrity broadly refers to the thoughtful and honest adherence to relevant ethical, disciplinary, and financial standards in the promotion, design, conduct, evaluation, and sharing of research. Pretty straightforward, easy, easy to understand, not always so easy to do. Oh, I'm sorry. So there's been a lot of work in this, on this uh, issue of what is the responsible conduct of research and how to teach it, and also what does it in entail. And so one person who's written a lot about this, Nick Stenick, who's at the University of Michigan, has, has written modules, introduction, books, introduction to the responsible conduct of research, and he's listed several sort of shared values for ethical research. Again, these are so straightforward, and yet they're so important. Honesty, conveying the information truthfully and honoring your commitments. Accuracy, reporting findings precisely and taking care to avoid errors. Efficiency, using resources wisely and avoiding waste. And objectivity, letting the facts speak for themselves and avoiding improper bias. Now, none of this is new. Who knows who that picture is? Anybody? Yeah, okay. 
Albert Einstein, who said many years ago, the right to search for truth implies also a duty. One must not conceal any part of what one has recognized to be true. So there speaks to the transparency. There are other um, values that people have published on um, discussions of responsible conduct of research, including quality and competence. So in, in addition to honesty and accuracy and transparency, there are some other things that seem right to me. Um, quality and competence, you have to know what you're doing. You have to have the skills to do what you're, uh, and be prepared to do what you're going to be doing. Collaboration and respect, we spoke about that a little bit yesterday. It's a collaborative endeavor. I always like to say clinical research is a, a team sport. There's a lot of members of the team and they're all important. And respect for each of their uh, contributions is critical. And transparency and openness, which I mentioned. So research integrity in a certain way is on a continuum with the other end of the spectrum being what people call research misconduct. And a lot of the, a lot of the attention that this topic has gotten um, in the literature and in uh, institutional policies and national policies is, is focused really on the, the bad conduct, the misconduct. I like to think of it as this continuum because I think uh, all of us appreciate that there are attributes of good research conduct or, sci or scientific integrity, or research integrity, and then there's a spectrum. It's not black and white. It's not one or the other. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about each of these things on this spectrum. So what is research misconduct? So in the United States, we have an agency called the Office of Research Integrity, and they have this definition of research mis misconduct. It's defined as fabrication, making things up, falsification, you know, changing them and altering them in some way to make them uh, different than what they really are, or plagiarism, copying somebody else's work. In proposing, performing, or reviewing research, or in reporting research results. So this is a very important definition of, sci of scientific or research misconduct. It's the definition that they use. There's a whole system in place to investigate allegations of one of these things at at the institutional level, and if it reaches a certain level of um, authentic authenticity in the sense of it's proven to be true, the allegation, then the Office of Research Integrity lists the person on their website, restricts their access to federal funds for research for some period of time, sometimes permanently, and uh, there are other sanctions against people who are found to, to have done one of these things. But I don't think also think that probably everyone in this room will recognize that this is a very serious, these are serious offenses, but these are probably not that common. And um, you know, how many people in this room know somebody or have worked with somebody that has been guilty of fraud, I mean, yes, fabrication, sorry, falsification or plagiarism? Anybody? No, one or two? <laughs> See? It could be a lot more, but... All right, so, scientific integrity in Brazil. I looked hard to try to find some literature on this topic, and this paper just came out, I don't know if you can see it, um, in July of 2014. We're now in September of 2014, so it was fairly recent. Now, there may be other literature, and I just wasn't able to find it. But, but this paper is actually quite good, because it describes that in Brazil, People are beginning to pay attention to this issue of scientific integrity. It actually describes six or seven cases that have occurred since uh, 2007 of um, people who were accused of scientific misconduct and sanctions were uh, put in place against them. And it also recognizes, which I hold to be true, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, that institutions in Brazil, at this moment anyway, tend to not have policies or procedures in place for investigating scientific misconduct. So that's something to keep in mind. What I think is actually more interesting is the middle. Um, I think most of us strive to be good scientists, to practice scientific integrity. Only a few people really do the sort of bad things, fabricate or falsify. But um, there's a lot of sort of in the middle 
what people call questionable practices that scientists um, undertake. And some people call this irresponsible. Uh, Ken Shine, who used to, uh, Bruce Alberts and Ken Shine, also from the National Academy, used to say, or did say in 1994, but even more damaging to the integrity of science are those behaviors that do not rise to the level of scientific misconduct, but nevertheless violate values held in common by the scientific community. So this may be, you know, mistreating your postdocs in a very visible way, or clamoring to get your name on the paper even though you didn't contribute the way authors are supposed to contribute to be recognized as authors. Um, those kinds of behaviors happen, I think, fairly regularly, and probably more than we should permit. So here's one way to sort of look at the spectrum, and you can see in a certain way that this um, goes from you know, sort of more acceptable behaviors to less acceptable behaviors as you go down. Um, best practices in, in research integrity, the questionable research practices, sloppy work, lack of expertise, ignoring policies, ignoring regulations. There's still other things. Um, unacceptable might be failure to correctly observe applicable, applicable policies and regulations, you know, enrolling human subjects without um, going to the IRB, for example. Um, and then there's misconduct, the deliberate attempts. So why? Why do you think there are questionable practices in research or even misconduct? And I think there's probably a, a lot of explanations. These are the ones that I thought of. Sometimes it's just sloppiness. You know, people just aren't paying attention and they do things sloppily. That's maybe human nature, but it's not acceptable in terms of really good science. You can't be sloppy about what you're doing. Sometimes it's lack of knowledge. People who don't ab abide by regulations or policies sometimes don't actually know that they exist or don't know what they say. Sometimes it's hubris. Um, I don't know about anybody else in this room, but I have met a couple of scientists in my lifetime who have had quite a bit of hubris. <laughs> sometimes it's competing interests. Competing interests, sometimes financial, not always financial. Sometimes it's competition. You need to do better than the guy down the hall. You need to get your paper accepted first. You need to get your study done first. You cut corners to get there. So connected to that, of course, is anxiety about the future. People who worry about if they don't get this grant, if they don't get this paper published, if they don't get this study done, they're not going to get funded the next time, and then they have no career. And then there's some malintent, but I, again, I think it's probably the minority, the vast minority. So I like to ask this question. This is a, a cartoon that I found, and you can see the cartoon is about politics. And the implication here is that you, when you enter a career in politics, you sort of check your ethics at the door. You deposit them before you go in. And so I think it's interesting to think about whether or not, or, to, or the extent to which we almost do this in research. I mean, I hear people saying things like, I think I said yesterday to you, you know, some investigators that I've spoken to, they say, okay, I go to the IRB, I get consent, done my ethics, it's too much trouble for me to do that anyway, I'm going to hire somebody to write the protocol for the IRB, and I'll hire somebody else to get the consent. I don't have to deal with ethics, that's somebody else's problem. And I think more and more we see people at least thinking that the ethical responsibilities that they have in doing research, they can be contracted out or given to somebody else. I am perhaps naively of the opinion that everybody has a responsibility, an ethical responsibility, to do their job appropriately and to do best practices in research integrity. And that it goes across the whole team. It's not just the, the team captain, it's not just the PI, it's every member of the team. Um, even the statisticians, and somebody said this morning, I don't have to worry about ethics, but absolutely, you do. So, I'm gonna give you just a couple of cases just for flavor. This. Um, actually was a story of, that was published about an investigator in the United States. Um, the first investigator, to my knowledge, and I think the only, to my knowledge, who actually went to jail for this. Um, and what he did, he was an obesity researcher at the University of Vermont, and for um, decades, he fabricated data. 
He fabricated data in the proposals that he submitted to the NIH. He fabricated data in the um, publications that he published in the literature, and he had quite a few publications. He fabricated data that his postdocs handed him, and he changed it. So there were lots of really egregious examples of fabrication of data in this case, and this gentleman um, not only went to jail, paid a huge financial fine, and is um, barred from receiving federal funding for research for the rest of his life. So that's a pretty serious offense. There are a couple of others. These are three on this one slide, so I'm just going to briefly talk through them. I don't know any of them. Let me just say I don't know any of these people. But the person on the left is a psychologist in the Netherlands, and he was accused of uh, fabricating data. And he had um, over 30 publications in his name with the data that was fabricated, and apparently has caused quite a stir in the psychology community about this issue of responsible research. The gentleman at the top, Andrew Wakefield, created a huge stir in the UK a few years ago. He is a vaccinologist who um, was accused of um, fabricating data about the adverse side effects of measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, and um, created a large controversy in the U UK. The, um, rate of vaccination went plummeted ba based on his data, and his data was found to be under several inves investigations, found to be fabricated. Now, interestingly, Dr. Wakefield, and he, he was removed from his position and also lost his license in the UK, but to date, and you can find articles about him in the paper, in online, or in, in, online he um, refuses to admit that he's guilty. He, he says he's, he, what he did was not wrong, and he stands by his data. This is in contrast, and I only put the name, to a um, gentleman, Dr. Sash Sasai, in Japan, who actually committed suicide this summer because he, was, he and his laboratory were accused of fabricating data about um, mouse stem cells. He took ordinary st uh, cells from mice and said he was able to turn them into viable stem cells. And that allegation is still under investigation, but he um, committed suicide in July. So I want to go back to Andrew Wakefield just for a second, because I think it's interesting to think about what are the kinds of things going on here. So one possibility that people talk about in his case, um, this is the gentleman in the UK, the MMR vaccine is that he had conflicts of interest. He owned, uh, he owned part of a company that had as its mission um, demonstrating the adverse events of vaccines in general, not just MMR. Possibly for those reasons, he, was, he had lack of objectivity. He falsified his data. There were a couple of people that worked with him. They also all lost their jobs. Um, he also probably overinterpreted the facts that might have been real. Some of the facts, some of the data that he did collect, he overinterpreted in a way that uh, misled the public and led to some pretty serious consequences. And he also was accused of inappropriate attention to human subjects protections. He enrolled children without the consent of their parents and sometimes um, by promising things to them that were unrealistic and so unduly influencing them to participate. There were two quotes that I thought were worth uh, sharing with you about this story um, from the BMJ, wh where a lot of this was published. Um, Fiona Godley, who's one of the editors of the BMJ, wrote these, th both of these quotes are hers. The original paper received so much media attention with so such potential damage to public health that it is hard to find a parallel in the history of medical science. And this was uncovered by an investigator reporter uh, from a newspaper in, in London. Such a breach of trust is deeply shocking. It raises important questions about how this could happen, what could be done to uncover it earlier, what can be done to prevent something like this happening again. And I think those are the right questions to be asking. So I'm going to tell you another story. This is another story of an uh, investigator from the United States, uh, John Cutler, who was a renowned um, physician, infectious disease physician, and a public service, a 
public servant, excuse me, he worked for the federal government for the public health service. And he was uh, involved in the Tuskegee studies, which you probably all know about. He was one of the investigators in those studies. But about uh, three years ago, um, it was uncovered that he was involved in a series of studies that were conducted in Guatemala in the 1940s, so it wasn't recently. But in those studies, he basically broke every rule. There were, there were very few rules in those days, let me say that. But there were some sort of general understandings about how research ought to be done, and he basically circumvented them all. Um, the sort of short story about these studies was he, uh, it was a study of prevention of syphilis, and he basically injected people with syphilis, not only uh, intramuscularly, but sometimes intracisternally. Um, and the people that were injected were, were people in um, a psychiatric hospital and in prisons. So again, how do we think about this case? Um, I think in this case you have to at least take a little bit into account the context. In the context, in those days there were no rules. There were very few rules about how to do research. But as we heard yesterday, there were people you know, in the 1900s who were getting consent from their participants. And so there was at least a notion that consent in certain kinds of studies was uh, needed. Um, there was also a notion that peer review and peer uh, sort of approbation of what you were doing was important. And it was clear from his records that he went to great lengths to try to hide what he was doing from a lot of people and actually never published anything from these studies at all. Um, lock of, lots of lack of attention to human subjects protections and just human rights and decency um, in those days. So, I, this is a slide that's probably too hard to see, but I wanted to, this is just one study that was done, sorry you can't see it, in 2005, where they asked um, scientists about behaviors that they engaged in that might have been questionable. And so some of the behaviors listed here are, thi are things like falsifying research data, has a very small percentage, ignoring major aspects of human subjects' requirements, not properly disclosing involvement in, in firms whose products are based on one's own research, relationships with students, subjects, or clients that may be interpreted as questionable. And I'm not going to read them all, but you can see as you sort of go down the list, the more egregious ones are at the top, and the percentage of people who saying they were involved is smaller. And as you go down in the sort of less egregious but still questionable kinds of activities, more and more people admit. So there's another interesting study, which I don't have a slide for. Uh, Daniel Finelli, it published in 2009 in PLOS Medicine. And I thought what he did was quite interesting. He asked scientists, how often have you been engaged in scientific misconduct or questionable practices. And the percentages were pretty small. I think it was 2% for the scientific misconduct and like 17% for the questionable practices. Then he asked the same people who, who go the, gave those results about themselves, how often have you noticed <coughs> colleagues, others that you work with, engaging in scientific misconduct or questionable practices? And the numbers, what do you think the numbers did? They went way up. I mean, in, in the scientific misconduct question, it was like five times the amount. And in the other one, you know, it was 36% to begin with, so it went up to like 80%. So, but 80%, 80% of scientists said someone they know engages in questionable practices in research. Now, there's also another phenomenon. This, this is how we sort of intersect with public trust. Um, there's been a recognition that since 2001, there has been a, a, a remarkable increase in the number of retractions from journals. So even though the number of publications increased by 44%, the number of retractions went up by 15 times since 2001. And so there's some interesting questions about this. You know, why is that the case? Are we just better at detection, at detecting the, the problems? Or is there actually more irresponsible science, or are the stakes higher? I think actually probably it's a little bit of all of those. I think we definitely are better at detection. 
and, and there's been another, um, there was a study recently published called The Trouble with Retractions, which recognized a couple of things. Even though the number in that previous article of retractions went up 15 times, the absolute number that was started with in 2001 was pretty small. It was only like 30, and now it's like 400. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is that journals are definitely using things that they didn't use even five years ago. Uh, journals are using um, software to help them detect plagiarism, to help them detect image ma manipulation and things like that, and they're, they're being pretty uh, serious about those kinds of violations. So this is from the same article that just shows you the, the rise in retractions, but again, from very small numbers to probably unacceptably high numbers, but um, from a very small start. And it, it also looked at across different journals, and it was true in every case, basically. So, I'm going back. Why? Why are we doing it? Why is this happening? Well, certainly, I've already talked about the individual level, you know, that there may be lack of information or, or training, and there may be personal shortcomings or lack of attention, hubris, conflicts of interest, competition, all those things. But I think it's also probably worth recognizing that it can't be the individuals only that's problematic. There are cases in which there's problems with the system and there's probably problems with the um, sort of culture of science and the incentive structure. And so we can, we can hold individuals accountable, but we have to make sure that the institutions that they work for, the kinds of training that they get, the cultures that they live in are amenable to uh, good conduct. So I love this poem, quote that came out of a book, uh, an old book, Walker Percy in 1971. Uh, Love in the Ruins is the name of the book. Here's the quote. Lord, grant that my discovery may increase knowledge and help other men. All what we're about, right? Failing that, O Lord, grant that it will not lead to man's destruction. Failing that, O Lord, grant that my article in Brain will be published before the destruction takes place. That's the culture of science, in a nutshell. I also think there's you know, larger questions. Science is held to some pretty high standards, but what are our sort of understandings of ethics in society? Um, and this is you know, a cartoon, but it's not very funny either. You know, here we are in an ethics class, perhaps, asking the question, how important are ethics? And everybody's cheating over the guy's shoulder. Um, there was a study that I read not too long ago that I thought was actually quite disturbing. It was looking at 19 to 18 to 25 year olds, and it um, was asking them about questions about what they thought was wrong, you know, what was morally wrong, and they all pretty much agreed that murder and um, rape, no, not even rape, murder and there were two things that they thought were wrong, and then there were other things, including rape and cheating and things like that that. They said, oh, it depends. it depends on the situation. And so that kind of study, now we can ask, is it representative? What were the, you know, what were the methods that were used? Is it, is it a valid study to interpret? But even if it isn't, it raises the question of whether or not we're training young people as they grow up in society about right or wrong in ways that endure in their careers. So now I'm going to turn for a few minutes. I'm going to have how many? A couple more. OK. Uh, conflicts of interest, because um, I was asked to talk about that as well. So what is a conflict of interest? A conflict of interest basically is a set of conditions. This, these are two definitions, and I'm going to tell you why I put two up there, because they're slightly different. A set of conditions in which professional judgment concerning a primary interest, such as the patient's welfare or the validity of research, tends to be unduly influenced by a secondary interest, such as financial gain. And a more recent definition um, basically captures most of the same thing, except it adds a, a phrase in here that I think is important, and that is the set of circumstances that creates a risk. So it's both uh, you know, the conditions that might influence somebody's judgment, but also the circumstances or conditions that might create the risk of that. Um, could, could potentially lead to a con conflict of interest. I think it's important, and I'm, not sh I'm sure most people know this, uh, 
Secondary interests can be financial, but they're not all financial. There are a lot of non-financial interests. Getting your paper published in Brain is, a, is an interest, a strong interest, and a reasonable interest for scientists to have. Maybe not worth the destruction of mankind, but uh, certainly a reasonable interest, and yet it's not a financial interest. And so secondary interests are not always, are not per se, bad. They're just, um, you know, pr problematic in the sense that they might distract you or distract somebody from their primary interest and influence how they ca carry out their primary interests. There's a lot of sources of conflict of interest, financial, professional, personal, prejudicial. I don't know really what prejudicial means. Um, and then we ask, why do we care about that? So this has relevance to what you've been hearing about all day. I think that people worry about conflicts of interest in clinical research, especially because they have the potential to influence a lot of things. The science, increase the risks to subjects, impede scientific openness, and undermine public trust. You also have the potential for uh, researchers anyway, and probably sponsors, um, to bias the way research is conducted. So choosing design, choosing outcomes, choosing control groups, how you conduct or analyze a study or interpret it or publish it or recruit subjects can all be biased by secondary interests. And I think, you know, there are data out there which I didn't bring and I, I didn't bring with me because I didn't want to go over my time, but there are data that show that actually financial interests actually do have some of these biases. They're documented. There's studies that have shown that there are differences in terms of how studies are reported, how studies are analyzed based on the, the interests of the investigators that are doing the studies, the financial interests. I did want to show a few slides, though, about how common uh, financial conflicts of interest are. So this was a study of life sciences faculty at 50 US universities that have the most support from the NIH. And basically, they asked about a bunch of different kinds of relationships that are all financial in some way. And the overall total um, of clinical faculty was more than 50%, and non-clinical faculty a little less than 50%, but more than 40. So pretty common. There's also been studies, this one, won, this one was done with members of IRBs and actually asked about the possibility that they had financial interests that might conflict with their responsibilities. And in fact, they found that it was uh, almost a quarter, 22.6% of the IRB members that were surveyed had some financial interests, which sometimes had to um, led to their recusal from the IRB deliberations, but not always. There's also concern about the conf financial interests of institutions and what they might uh, promote or allow because of their financial interests. And this doesn't really, uh, this slide doesn't really um, give you any indication of how common this is, but it does, what it do did ask about, excuse me, was whether um, they, the institutions had policies about conflicts of interest. And what, you, what you'll see down here is that uh, somewhere between 40% and 80% of institutions that were um, looked at had policies, with the highest one being institutional review boards, that they had po policies about conflicts of interest, um, and then a range beyond that. So how do we address conflicts of interest? There are three ways that people talk about. Um, disclosure, disclosure of potential relationships to institutions, to IRBs, to participants, to journals, et cetera. Uh, management of those uh, financial relationships. Um, and that means generally that somebody reviews them or there are limits in place or um, in some cases after review there's uh, decisions about what you can and cannot do as a part of a particular study. And there are some places that prohibit them. So what about disclosure? <clears throat> I love this cartoon. <laughs> An advantage of disclosure, according to uh, Dennis Thompson, is that those who might be affected have the information to be able to use it and make a decision about whether or not it affects their interests. 
And I think this is, a, in principle, a good idea. I think it's also interesting to think about the kinds of prejudices and biases that we bring to the table. And so if we see um, certain studies that are sponsored by somebody who has a lot of money, some company that has a lot of money, we may read it differently than if we see that it's sponsored by somebody who doesn't. Um, the AAMC, which is the Association of American Medical Colleges, also put out some guidance in 2003 that was very influential in the United States about conflicts of interest. And one of the things that they recommended that consent forms should have information about um, financial interests of investigators in the consent form. There have been a number of studies that have looked at what people who are participants in research think about that whether they think it's a good idea, a bad idea, or are neutral on information in the consent forms about financial interests of their investigators. And basically, a little more than half of the studies, <coughs> people thought it was really important for information to be disclosed. In the, the other four out of the 10, they didn't, they didn't think it was so important. Um, but only about a quarter of all of the participants said it would affect in any way their willingness to participate in the study. Um, some years ago, I did a qualitative study, a small amount of people, um, where I interviewed them in depth about this issue. And what I found interesting, most people said, well, it'd be nice to know, but I really have no idea what those, uh, don't give me any numbers. I don't know what any of that means. I, I can't put that into context. And there was a small percentage, less than 10%, but a small percentage who said, if you told me that the investigator had financial interests, I'd be more interested in participating because I, I think that the investigator would do a really good job. So it goes both ways. Um, the NIH has a lot of rules about um, financial conflicts of interest. These are the rules from the extramural side, as Dr. Gallen explained to you yesterday, we have both intramural and extramural, which I know you, you do too. And there are rules for managing for managing the level of investments that people are allowed to have and what happens if they have more than those. And I'm not going to read the details, but I'm happy to get it for you if you'd like. It's also available online. <coughs> and, and then there's recommendations from the Institute of Medicine about prohibiting, prohibiting financial interests in the, in the context of certain kinds of um, research. So academic medical centers and other research institutions should establish a policy that individuals generally may not conduct research with human participants if they have a significant financial interest in, the, in an existing or potential product or company that could be affected by the outcome of that research. There are exceptions. So I think an important question to ask in 2014 is how well are these um, objectives, how well are these rules and strategies of disclosure, management, and prohibition accomplishing their goals? How well are they reducing the possibility of bias in science, minimizing risk, protecting reputations? And I think, I think the answer is we might believe that they are, and I think most people do believe that they are, but we need evidence. We need some evidence on how this is making a difference and if it is making a difference. So I'm just going to end with a, just a couple of slides about cultivating um, ethical research. So this is responsible conduct of research. And these are things like, I mean, rules and standards actually do help. They help. They put uh, lines in the sand for people. And they give people guidance on how to proceed. So they are very useful. They have to be carefully constructed. They have to be, um, you know, sometimes flexible. It depends on what it is. But anyway, they're, they're important and very useful. Best practices can be taught, best practices can be developed, best practices can be reported and shared with others. Training and education is really useful in a lot of ways, and I'm going to, the last two slides I'm going to show you a couple of training programs that are online that you can use, anybody can use. Opportunities to, to discuss difficult cases. I think even with training, even with rules and standards, there are situations that people get in that are really hard and you need opportunities and people you can trust to talk to about how to resolve them and resources for assistance. And I think incentives and consequences, they, they often go with the rules and the standards. So sometimes if you break certain rules, there are consequences. If you do something well, there might be incentives to do something well or rewards even. Um, that's pretty much 
repetitive. I'm going to show you these a couple of slides. This is the Office of Research Integrity of the United States Department of Health and Human Services that has this program on it called The Lab. And it's basically, as you can see, an interactive movie on research misconduct. And they, they use a number of cases. They have actors. I mean, it's, it's a very useful way to begin the conversations about uh, research integrity. Um, and it can be used, again, by anyone adapted. There are also some sites. This is Michigan State University. has a bunch of cases online with questions that they follow. And there are other, other RCR programs online that you can, again, most of them are case-based. But this, you know, is an example. Here's a uh, young investigator, I'm assuming, filling out a grant application. And he doesn't, he didn't do any preliminary work that's going to support his application. So what does he do? Makes it up. And then the question is, why is that bad? <laughs> and there are a, a series of, of cases like that. Um, I'm going to skip this because I've already said it. I'm going to end with something funny. I hope you can see this. This is a slide that I thought would be fun just for all of you sitting here listening to me. The guy in the first box says, and we'll finish up our ethics tour with tips in, I can't even read it, testifying, OK, and questions, yes, in the back. And so the guy in the back says, yeah, I'd like to know why I'm here. I'm 49 years old. I learned the difference between right and wrong a long time ago. If I make unethical or unlawful choices, it's because I damn well mean to, not because I don't know any better. And the instructor says, OK, you're excused. And then everybody else jumps up. Hey, what about me? I'm 53. What about me? I'm 60. So I thought this was a cute, cute way to end. I don't think this is right. I think even though we all learned right and wrong, when we were kids, um, we are constantly relearning the, the ways that right and wrong fits into specific circumstances. And in the conduct of research, you know, aiming for best practices and research integrity is incredibly important for both the field of research and for public trust. Thank you. <laughs>